Okay, so it's a pleasure to have Professor Amitabhul Aidi from the SMBO Center as our colloquial speaker today. Um, uh, Professor Lahiri did his uh, undergrad at uh, the Archbishop Presidency College, as many of our colloquial speakers uh, tend to do. Uh, and uh, he did his PhD from the Syracuse University in the US and postdocs from Los Alamos National Lab in the US and University of Sussex. Uh, and then he came back to India and became a faculty member at the SNBO Center, where he has been since then. Uh, Professor Lahiri's uh, expertise is uh, quantum field theory in various situations like uh, field theory in the curved space time, uh, as well as various uh, applications of various gauge theories. I was just looking through his recent papers. One thing that caught my eye was he has shown that uh, uh, inertia uh, is generated by uh, space time geometry. Uh, so that that seemed very interesting. Uh, although today's talk will probably not on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, well, partly, yeah, yeah. maybe. Um, um, so, <clears throat> and also, uh, since uh, we have a uh, memorandum of understanding with the SNBOS Center, so we we have many collaborations, so not research collaboration, but we have, well, our students do projects. Yeah. Uh, so, so some of you may go and do a project with uh, some of the faculty members there next year. And also one of our students is currently doing a project there. From the recent batch, there were two students. That's right. So one of our PhD students, Professor Tapos Bag, there is a is a uh, co advisor. So we have uh, so uh, it's one of those uh, you know institutions who are very very close and sort of a sister brother institutions <laughs> to us. So we are very glad to have Professor Larry as a speaker today. So yeah. thank you, Ritavan, and um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'll speak in English. That's how I prepared. Uh, this is a talk that I have never given before. And uh, also, uh, this audience is uh, somewhat different from the usual audience that I have for my talk. So I have to, I had to prepare it somewhat differently. So uh, what I'll talk about is uh, based mostly on quantum mechanics rather than on anything else. And so this is all standard stuff. and. Um, so only the last slide will talk about uh, my current work and uh, where it is going. So basically, the problem is, uh, the, I have called it the solar neutrino problem, uh, the talk, I think, I uh, forget what the name actually was. Uh, the solar neutrino problem is uh, something about missing neutrinos. This problem has been known for uh, something like more than 60 years, uh, nearly 60 years. Now, most of you know what neutrinos are. They are uh, particles which are conjectured by Pauli to account for missing energy and momentum in uh, beta decay, in nuclear beta decay. So in, they found that in, uh, uh, when, when, the, uh, new, when a neutron decays, basically when a nucleus decays, you find uh, a resulting nuclei and you find the beta rays, which are basically electrons. But that did not balance the total uh, energy and momentum, and they couldn't find anything else that could actually carry out, carry out, carry out the, the energy and momentum. So Pauli conjectured, uh, Bohr actually conjectured that maybe energy and momentum are not conserved in nuclear decays. In nuclear decays, they didn't know it was called weak decays then. So uh, Pauli thought that was completely ridiculous, and uh, he was he was right, of course. But 
then he conjectured that there was another particle called the neutrino. Neutrino means small neutron, basically. So neutrino, which carried out carried out the energy and momentum which was missing from the uh, measurements of beta beta decay. And uh, so John Updike wrote this poetry about neutrinos. It's actually a long poem. And I just uh, took the first stanza. So neutrinos, they're very small. They have no charge and have no mass and do not interact at all. So this is why they couldn't be found, because they do not interact with anything. They do not have any charge. They do not have any mass. So they're not like any other particle that we know. OK, so uh, we cannot actually see them. Because they do not interact with, the, with our retina. So we do not see them. So they have a very weak interaction with uh, electrons and uh, maybe protons and neutrons. But uh, that interaction is so weak that it's very hard to see. And the Earth is just a silly ball to, to, to them through which they simply pass, like dust makes down a drafty hall or photons through a sheet of glass. So it's just transparent to neutrinos because they do not interact. They go through. That's why they are very difficult to find. So Hawley conjectured them in 1930. So he actually, he did not give a talk about this. He did not write a paper. He wrote on the back of a postcard and sent it to a meeting saying that, I think this is what happens. Okay, and of course, uh, that is actually what happened, but uh, it was never published in, a, in anything. And uh, people thought about this and realized that it could be right. And so they started looking for it. And uh, uh, this uh, discovery took 26 years because it was very difficult to find. And um, Bauman and Lyons, and Lyons got a Nobel Prize in 1995. That was another 30 years, uh, sorry. 40 years, yes. 39 years. Okay? And Khan did not get any. Khan was already dead. Khan died in 1975. Okay? Or 76. So Rhines got a Nobel Prize because I think uh, I read somewhere that Rhines uh, had spent the maximum time uh, you know, looking at neutrinos or looking at one particle. The maximum time compared to any physicist looking at one particle all his life. So Ryan's got Nobel Prize in 1995, and uh, muon neutrinos were found in 1962, which was uh, which was 19, uh, very soon after. The first one was anti-neutrino. The uh, in 1990, 1956, the neutrino itself, the electron neutrino, was found after the muon neutrinos in 1965. I forget who. who, who after anti-neutrino was found. Yes, because that was no, that was because it's neutron decay, right? Neutron decay is proton, electron, and anti-neutron. So they found the anti neutrinos. So with mu one also, they found the mu one anti neutrinos. I mean, they are not even very different. <laughs> well, yes, it's chargeless, but uh, uh, the, the issue is about chiral. But anyway, so they found anti neutrinos. And um, so, um, anyway, so mu one neutrinos were found in 1962, and that was Lederman and some others. So, they got a Nobel Prize in 1988, so that was again a long time. Tau neutrinos were found in 2000, they didn't know. And uh, these neutrinos were always found in decays involving charged leptons. So the electron neutrino is found with the electron, the muon neutrino is found with the muon, and the tau neutrino is found with the tau particle, with the tau lepton. And so it sort of uh, worked out that they are all partners of this charged lepton. So these uncharged particles are partners of charged leptons. Like, you know, it's actually very similar to saying that nucleons are, uh, I shouldn't even say nucleons. I, I think they are called nucleons, right? Neutrons and protons. They're like partners, yes. right? So neutron is charge zero and proton is charge one. But other than that, there is very little difference between them. There is a difference in mass. And that mass is something that nobody can explain. Okay, that difference, that is something that, has, that is still there. But other than that, uh, it's very similar. They're very similar. And similarly, for these leptons, there are charged leptons and uncharged leptons. Charged leptons are these electrons, muons, and tau particles, and uncharged leptons are the um, neutrons. Oops, where did I go? I need to go back. Yeah. Right. Right, so you can see that I prepared this in a hurry, so I forgot to do this by stages. I finished this la last night at 11.30. So, anyway. Uh, so, so, I should mention that Professor Lydie started from Purulia early morning today. Yes. And then we the the taught a class and then came to this talk. So, additional thanks to him yes. for <laughs> doing this. It's okay. 
I have never done this before. So <laughs> that is exceptional for me as well. So anyway, so um, you can see how weak the interaction is. There are you know, seven times 10 to the 10 neutrinos passing through each square centimeter of our body, okay? Through, through the earth. And that's a lot of neutrinos. It's not It's not a lot if you think about it. I mean, the, we are uh, dealing with Avogadro numbers all the time, right? And gas and everything. But you can see those things. You can feel the pressure. You can sort of see if you if you have 10 to the 23 electrons, that's going to be a thick beam. Okay. But this is not like that. This is just passing through every centimeter, every square centimeter, every second. And you still don't see anything. Okay. And it's very difficult to uh, measure them. And these, these neutrinos are mostly from uh, the proton proton interactions in the solar core. That is where our energy comes from. Most of the sun's energy comes from there. Protons interact to form a deuteron. So it's like the inverse beta decay. So it creates, it goes from one proton becomes a neutron and that becomes a deuteron to proton, proton plus proton. So that creates a positron and a neutron. Okay. And the energy that produces is basically most of the energy that the sun produces. It's, it's like 90% or something. I think Ruta Vana Suchatana are more of an expert for these things. And these things do not have any electric charge and they have vanishing mass. So only weak interactions are there. Yeah. Weak interactions literally is true. It's a, a 10 to the minus 5 strength compared to electric, uh, you know, electrical interactions. So um, those interactions are very weak and because they do not have any, have any mass, we do not actually feel them. We do not feel them hitting anything. Okay. So they are very difficult to measure. And this uh, super Kamioka uh, neutrino detector experiment, super Kamioka and De. So there, uh, the uh, super Kamioka and De 4, that is the current one, their detection rate is 15 uh, per day. I think uh, their size is something like 3,000 tons of water, maybe yeah, more. It's, okay. uh, it's a few thousand tons of water. Uh, I, I, I forget, I, it's a huge number, maybe bigger than 3,000. It's probably 200 meter cube or something. It's like an auditorium full of water. Yes, it's it's like 200 meters cube, bigger than an auditorium. It's bigger than not. It's like a football field uh, and uh, stand, standing up. Uh, and, yeah, something 50 kilos. Okay. So that's a huge amount of water. And those that water has, you know, the protons and deuterons and some uh, tritium as well. And that interacts with the neutrinos, and that is how they are found usually. And with that much uh, water, with that many uh, atoms in there, that many protons, you still get only about 15 a day. Okay. And uh, so these have, but still, solar neutrinos have been detected for a long time. They have been, uh, people have been detecting them since the early 1960s, and that is the Homestake experiment uh, for which Ray Davis. Junior, yeah. Red Davis three, yeah. Red Davis Junior. Red Davis. Right? Well, he decided to no, see. He did some uh, work for the army. Then I think he joined Bell Labs or something, and then he asked for a problem that said that would make him think. So you know, he didn't actually ask. I think he tried to find a problem that would make him think, and so he decided to pick on measuring uh, the neutron flux. And then he found, you know, he spent his life doing this and got a Nobel Prize out of it. So then he found that the number of neutrinos, he, he actually measured neutrinos. He, he found that he could find neutrinos, but the number of neutrinos that he found was quite a bit less than what was expected from the number of um, inter reactions that are going on inside the solar core. I mean, that you can estimate. That number you can estimate by the energy that we get. We know how much energy this proton-proton interaction is uh, giving us. So we know how much energy we are getting from the sun. There is a fairly good solar model, solar energy model, that sort of tells us how many interactions are going on. And so we know how much, what is the number of neutrinos that are being produced in the solar core. Then we can calculate. It's like, you know, this usual Gauss law one by R square kind of calculation. And we can calculate how many neutrinos should be hitting the earth. And that is what is said 10 to the 10, uh, 10 to the 10 neutrinos per square centimeter. And he found that it's still missing. Okay. Number of neutrinos is missing. Uh, number of neutrinos is less than what uh, was expected. 
So the expected number of events, uh, this uh, can be calculated from the standard solar model. As I said, the luminosity is determined by the number of reactions. And what they found, what uh, Ray Davis found, was that the observed number was only about one third of what was expected. And I think it was John Bacall who uh, figured out that the number is actually uh, what the number should be. He looked at the solar model, he calculated the number of neutrinos that should be there and found that the observed number is one third of that. And this is the solar neutrino problem. Okay. So this problem, I would say, was unsolved for a long time. Even though people had some idea of how to solve it, it was still, you know, there was no uh, proof of that, so to speak. This 2002 is Ray Davis Jr. So Ray Davis Jr. got a Nobel Prize in 2002 and his measurements were in the early 1960s and I think around 1967 or 69, he first uh, concluded that the number of neutrinos is less than it should be. Okay, and uh, John Bacall did not get one. So did John Bacall? No, get one? No. John Bacall did not get one. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, it was confirmed after Cameo Kande also found the same right. number. So then they took out right. Cameo Kande and yes. reading. They there was no snow also. That probably there was no results. And yes. Results yes. 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 Then, yeah. the, the, the huh. Red was so for the problem, three people got, and then for the solution, two others. Yeah. <laughs> Bacon did not get one, which is a bit uh, okay, odd. But anyway. Uh, yes. He, in 2002? I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I think it was after 2002. So people were expecting that he would get it as Red Davis Jr., but huh. he didn't. But he was a theoretician, right? So in 2002, I think, was only the um, experiment. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the theory behind this, uh, how to explain this solar neutrino problem, how to find uh, the solution and explain it. So what I'm going to say is basically, you know, best done with uh, the Lagrangian point of view, but most of you have not done quantum field theory, so I'm going to skip the Lagrangian point of view, and I'm going to talk about only the equations. We have seen equations, of course. We have seen, seen Schrodinger equation and similar things. So I'm going to talk about the equations. And even if you have not seen Dirac <laughs> equation, you will probably see it very soon. So that is what I start with. So this first one is the Dirac equation. And I we have the Dirac equation. Suppose I have two free fermions. Okay? Two free fermions, mass, masses are different, mass n1 and mass n2. So they will satisfy the Dirac equation. They're, I'm, I'm saying, I'm taking it to be the wave functions of these two particular fermions. Um, and uh, what I'm going to say now also works for the Schrodinger equation, the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, but I'll write Dirac equation because that's what they satisfy. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Okay, even if you, if you are unable to follow what I'm saying, then please ask. Okay, because I don't know whether you are following or not. You are looking at me. I have no idea whether you are <laughs> listening or whether you are falling asleep or whether you are just not, you know, getting into it. So if you have any questions, please ask. So I have no problem stopping and explaining. I don't have very much there. I, you know, I, I think it's going to be a very short talk. And so if you ask, it will go on for an hour. Anyway, so um, if I look at these two equations, I, you know that in quantum mechanics, we say that the wave function can be multiplied by a phase e to the power i theta, that does not change anything. So I have these two equations. So these two equations also I can multiply by independent e to the power i theta 1 and i theta 2, and you know, both of them remain invariant, right? Theta is constant, so it just comes out. Whatever I multiply it by, it will just come, so come out. And of course, so functions can be, can be multiplied by a phase, so I can always do this. So it says that these are independent U1 transformations. U1, if you remember your group theory, I don't know if you have studied this, in a C, you should have. And u1 is basically e to the power i theta, okay? elements of u1. So if the two masses are the same, m1 and... <laughs> okay. So applied root theory. <laughs> right. So um, if, I, if the masses are the same, then I can write these two um, equations together as a doublet, okay? like a matrix equation. So this is a column vector. And I write i d slash minus m. And I have the two wave functions. Okay? This is zero. Now, this equation is invariant under an overall multiplication by a number again. And again, I can multiply by e to the power i theta. 
but this is also invariant under more general transformation by a U2 matrix. U2 is a 2 by 2 unitary matrix. Okay, U dagger U is 1. I don't know if you have studied that today. Okay, so you have studied that today as well. <laughs> so that's very good. So it's invariant under a uh, more general transformation by a U2 matrix. Okay. And what does the U2 matrix do? It takes this column vector and mixes the two, right? It's a two by two matrix, so it mixes the two things. And this invariance is a starting point for weak interactions. And uh, using lepton doublets that we mentioned earlier, this neutrino and electron neutrino and on and so on. But we are not going into there. I mean, I thought about talking about that, but that is not uh, the focus of my talk. I'm not going into there at all. I'm just mentioning that uh, U2 is quite familiar to people who are going to do particle physics because uh, your weak, weak interactions, theory of weak interactions start from U2 and if you have SU3 then you get U3 of strong interactions and so on. But here I'll just stick to left, uh, this, these neutrinos now. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, so what I want to mention is a kind of flavor mixing for neutrinos. The reason I mentioned the U2 uh, okay, it's just a sort of trick to make you think about mixing. Okay, so it's just there are two kind of uh, two fermions, then you have a U2 transformation. And now I have three types of neutrinos. So suppose for a moment that they all have the same mass. Okay? <laughs> and then I can write them in a triplet, like a column vector. Okay, and they will also satisfy each of them, satisfy the Dirac equation when they're free. Okay, and for two particles, so two F functions, I had U2 transformation that left it invariant, and now I have U3, right? This kind of uh, transformation, psi prime going to U, U times psi, this U will be a 3 by 3 unitary matrix, okay? So this is just a complex 3 by 3 matrix. And we say that it's U, U3, and U3 is SU3 plus U1, so that you may not know right now. But basically what this means is that U3 has determinant. If you take a 3 by 3 complex unitary matrix, the determinant is a phase. Okay, Because when you take U dagger U equals 1, you take the determinant of both sides, you get that U star times that U equals 1. Okay, So that means determinant of U is a phase. So you can take the phase out. You take the phase out, uh, one third of the phase uh, comes out as common. And then the remaining, term, remaining matrix is determinant plus 1. Okay, so that is called an SU3 matrix, and the phase is basically U1, so that I call it SU3 plus U1. And this mixes these three wave functions, right? So this mu1, mu2, mu3, whatever these neutrinos are, they are going to get mixed by this 3 by 3 complex matrix, right? If you have a three dimensional vector in space and you apply a rotation vector, then you just mix their components, you mix the components of the vector. Right, that's like rotating the basis. So, so here you have a complex three vector, and you have a complex three by three matrix, which does the same. Thing. It mixes up. Okay, U dagger U. You keep that in mind. That we don't need that right now. But it's basically mixing up these things. Okay, so these three are getting mixed up, and so you could say that this U matrix, this uh, U three matrix, this causes a rotation in complex 3D space. Right? That's exactly what we are doing. Okay. Rotation, of course, not in real space. This is a complex vector space. Okay. Three uh, complex, uh, three component complex vectors. And then we can say, so we can say that this U matrix mixes the neutrino flavors. Okay. So by flavor, I mean whether it's electron or muon or tau and so on. So or three types of neutrinos. It, the same mass in this case. So we say that this U matrix mixes the nucleus. Again, I have only shown this to um, sort of get you used to the idea of mixing. Neutrinos do not have to have the same mass. I mean, I can always write three uh, wave functions like this if they have approximately the same kind of properties, not necessarily the same mass. But I can always write this and multiply this by a 3 by 3 matrix and then I'll say that they mix. right? I don't care whether what mixing causes, that comes later. But I can always write this, I can write, make this operation and say that it mixes the three components. right? 
There is no um why not two, why not four? No, no, two it has to be the one it cannot be because then might be so those are the anomaly conditions. Those are the anomaly conditions. So there is an anomaly condition which basically says that it has to be three. No, it of says it has to be three. But people have looked at this thing with four and five, and it's not completely ruled out. But then again, how many dimensions do we have? You ask a string theorist and they'll say we have ten. Yeah. So but because that's because sometimes people talk about these other species of maybe you know the sterile sterile, species, yeah, the sterile. sterile comes because of neutrino masses and uh, mm -hmm. I think there was a more of an expert on those things. But uh, anyway, so uh, but uh, sterile neutrino comes because we want to have we do not have we do not see right handed neutrinos in nature. Right. So you find out you figure out that there is some other species of neutrinos which only comes as right handed or something. Okay, so. So that is the reason. Yes, but nobody has seen anything like that. And whether it, they're actually observable, I don't know. Okay. So that's a still an open question. Anyway, that is not necessarily a new generation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I have just one basic question. Now, you said the U is basically causing the, the rotation of due to the U is basically causing this mixing of the flavors. Right? Yes. Yeah. So when you have when you have unequal masses, these yes. unequal mass couples, they are not affecting this rotation anymore. What? I'm just mixing them. I'm not writing I'm not doing anything. I'm not claiming that they are giving you something different. It's mixing, right? Yeah. I write this. I'm not saying that the mixed thing is something. Oh, no, that remains kind of a constant. No, oh. I'm not saying that it is something. I'm saying that you are mixed with that person. That does not give me anything. I multiply you by three and multiply him by four and add by divide by seven. I'm just doing this. I'm just saying that I mix this. This is the way of mixing. Okay. It's an operator. So instead, any, any kind of condition fired, I cannot do. No, I can always do. I have a vector, I have a linear operator. That's it. I can always do that. I can always do that. But that's not nothing. Absolutely nothing. The only thing that will actually your question is relevant when I say that I mix and get something physical. Yes. That's when the real question is. What do I get? Is that the physical thing? Here I have not claimed anything as yet. Okay. So <clears throat> as I said, you, know, you can see the last line. The equation of motion will not be in there. So that is not a physical thing as yet. Okay. So I had three particles at three fermions, they had equations of motion. That was that made them physical. If you have a particle with a mass, you have the equation of motion. That's a physical particle. When I mix them, that is not necessarily a physical particle. Okay, I'd say it's not a physical particle. Okay. So the solution of the solar neutrino problem comes from here. That is say that neutrinos with well-defined masses do not have well-defined flavors. Okay. Now I have to be careful about what I say. Or you have to be careful about listening to this. So. We mentioned three different flavors, the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. Okay, these are flavors, these occur in these doublets, these lepton doublets with charged leptons, which means that there are interactions where the electron and say antineutrino are created together, for example, in the neutron decay. Okay, so in muon decay, you might find you know an electron is created with a, a muon neutrino. Okay, so things like that will happen. So you have a process in which there is a muon that breaks into an electron, an anti-electron neutrino, and a muon neutrino. Okay, so there is all the, there are all these balances that uh, things are getting balanced. So wherever there is a muon, there has to be in the process that some kind of neutrino will come out. But those things are not physical. They do not have well-defined equations of motion because they do not have well-defined masses because I have mixed. That is the solution. The solution is that there are states of definite flavor, electron, muon, and tau. There are states of different masses, definite masses. So I call them M1, M2, M3. So both mass and flavor are observable. That doesn't mean they all commute with the Hamiltonian. Okay. So they are observables, which means 
the eigenvalues of the observables will provide orthonormal eigenvectors. You know this from quantum mechanics. So the eigenvalues of the masses, where you have m1, m2, m3, they will give you three eigenvectors, which are all ortho orthonormal to one another. So m1 does not mix with m2. I mean, m1 is orthonormal to m2. The flavors are also observable. So the flavors will also give you orthonormal eigenvectors. So one flavor is orthonormal to another flavor, but the flavor and the masses are not the same. Okay. So what that means is that there is a mass basis and a flavor basis, and these two are related by this U kind of rotation. So it's an electron neutrino, mu one neutrino, tau neutrino. Uh, electron is shangya as the anti uh, electron shangya as the electron neutrino. Jokhon amar at a neutron decay hotsu, jokhon amar at a proton as the electron as the anti electron neutrino as the. Right? Jokhon amar mu one decay hotsu, jokhon mu one at the ke amar negative charge as the ke mu one the ke electron berotsu. Tar shangye amar ek ta anti electron neutrino berotsu. Habe amar lepton charge conservation ke jono electron lepton number conservation ke jono. Ar ek ta berotsu habe shete hotsu mu one neutrino. Amar mu one lepton number conservation ke jono. Okay, muon thake, I am saying that when muon to decay, I get uh, an electron for the electric charge, an anti-electron neutrino for the electron lepton number, and a muon neutrino for the muon lepton. So that is the flavor. The electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino. These three are the flavors. Types. 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 But the flavor is important. The word flavor means that they take part in weak interactions. I'll come to that. So, this uh, flavor eigenstates are uh, what uh, take part in weak interactions. So, when, whenever you create these neutrinos by some interaction or by a decay, they are created as flavor eigenstates. And those things are orthonormal. So, if you are creating a, an electron neutrino, that does not have any projection to a muon neutrino state. Okay. So, those are orthonormal. But once they are created, they propagate as mass eigenstate because Hamiltonian is mass, right? Hamiltonian is energy. So they have to propagate as Hamiltonian eigenstates and that's where the mass eigenstate comes in. But mass is a mixture of the different flavor states, right? So they propagate and after a while, and I'll show you how to do this. After a while, you'll, if you measure them again, they may not remain in the original flavor state because they have mixed. And if the rotation has you know, proceeded with time and they have mixed more, it may not be in the same mixture that was there originally. It's not necessarily the same linear combination, right? So it may be a different linear combination, different mixture, and you'll find something different. So, uh, mass eigenstates in the flavor basis oh. and the flavor eigenstates in yes. the mass basis. Oh, I'll do that in the next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> so here, so this is what I said. <laughs> the, uh, that is Yes, Hamiltonian is uh, diagonal in the mass basis, and weak interactions are diagonal in the flavor basis. Okay, these two are different things. Any question? Any other question? Okay, right, right. So now this is the mixing. Okay, so I can write the uh, flavor uh, states. So uh, here I am writing, you know, typically uh, how I do. It. Uh, quantum mechanics. So I have the the only thing is that there is a, a bit of a degeneracy in the symbols. Symbols. So this new one ket is the vector, the basis vector, and new one is the coefficient. They, everybody does this, and this is extremely confusing. Okay. So this is the first thing that I I just figured out uh, when I was writing this talk that I have not fully understood this. So um, this. Uh, Basis vector and the coefficient are given the same symbol. I mean, people run out of symbols very quickly. There are so many particles, right? So, uh, I mean, you have to introduce the Bangla vocabulary after a while. So, other than that, you have this. So, these are the coefficients. These new e, new mu. These are the coefficients. New one, new two. These are the coefficients. So, I have this in the mass basis. I write them as a linear superposition. And in the flavor basis, I have a similar thing with basis of mu e, mu mu. Exactly. This is the 3 plus 3 matrix that gives you a mixing. So I start with, uh, I look at this uh, uh, components in the flavor basis, and I can, what I say is that they're uh, 
result of a unitary transform transformation from the mass basis. Okay, so this is what the, it looks like. So explicit, and we can write it like this. This is just that, and uh, this this is just a parameterization issue. So you have to remind me of the time. Okay, I think I'm going longer than this. Okay. So this three by three unitary matrix needs nine real parameters. I'm not going to work this out. You can work this out yourself. It's unitary. So once you put the unitary condition, there are uh, three conditions in the diagonal and six conditions in the off diagonal. So uh, there are total 18 for nine times two complex numbers. And uh, so 18 minus nine is nine. So you're left with nine uh, real parameters, which are all angles. Uh, you, you three are all angles. They are not uh, open. Uh, parameters and so angles means that you can uh, write them as phases, right? And remember that whenever you have a transformation like this, each of these are basically coming from, from wave functions, huh? and wave functions are defined up to an arbitrary phase, right? So I have six wave functions here, three on the left and three on the right. I can take out one common phase from all six of them. I'll be left with five. Okay, so those five are absorbed in the wave functions. Okay, so from the nine, five are eliminated because they're absorbed in the wave function. So four phases will be left. So four parameters will be four real parameters. All of them are angles will be needed to parameterize this uh, three by three complex matrix. Okay, so these four angles are called theta 1, 2, theta 1, 3, theta 2, 3, and delta Cp. They have certain meanings. We are not going to go into that in this lecture. But uh, basically, I, I, I should mention only one thing, that this delta Cp is related to, uh, it's a measure It's a measure of the Cp violation, okay? charge parity violation. Charge parity violation of the charge parity symmetry. We are going to sort of focus on uh, two flavors of matrix, uh, two flavors of neutrinos for simplicity. Because I want to show you how these things are calculated, and that is best done in uh, two flavors. So for two flavors, this U matrix is just two by two, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, and in that case, I have four real angles because two by two complex is four, and again, it's still angles. Okay? This U two is a, uh, what is called a compact group, so that's a, those are angles, and you have two on the left and two on the right, and as I said, you can take out a common phase, and then you have three phases that can be absorbed in the wave functions. So only one angle is needed. Okay. And that is basically the same as a rotation matrix in two dimensions. Cos theta sin theta minus sin theta cos theta. Okay. Any question? I'm speaking too much. So if you have any question, maybe I'll be I'll have some time to stop. Maybe this uh, rotating around the phases I have to take out of no, yeah, it's quantum mechanics. It's not in grip theory. Yeah. But it's compactness, compactness of is issue three, I think you should right. say something in a class. Okay. Why is it compact? Why are they all angles? I think that is important. Thing. So um okay. So we talked about um, the I wrote the rotation matrix for um, the components of the wave function. You can also write them in terms of the basis. This is uh, con convenient to write in this case because I want to show you how to calculate this. And you know, most uh, okay. This is different from what we wrote in the paper. So, so um, I'm I'm just following a slightly different convention. I'll discuss it with you afterwards. So uh, for basis states, we have this. Okay. So you can. Um, I'm not going to work this out, but basically what this means is that the vector remains invariant. The vector is something that is um, objective, uh, objective in the sense that you make a rotation of the basis states and you make a rotation on the components and you can do that simultaneously, but the vector will remain invariant. Okay, so, no, 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 not not the vector, vector itself. So it's like saying, um, I have a vector, right? I'm not rotating the vector. I'm rotating the basis. And then the components of the vector in the new basis are different, but the vector remains the same. Yeah. So I can write them. So I have a vector, say, call that vector V. So Vx, Vy, Vz, and I have Ex, Uy, Ez. Okay. So I make a rotation. I call it uh, E prime X 
uh, ex prime, ui prime, z prime, and I have three new components, vx prime, vy prime, vz prime. So that vx, ex plus vy, ui plus vz, z is the same in the new one. But what does that mean? That means if I write that as a matrix, I have to have inverse operations. Okay, the one, if I write vx, vy, vz as a column vector and rotate that with a rotation matrix and I write e1, ex, ui, z again as a column vector and do that um, as, as a uh, matrix rotation, then the two rotations have to be inverses of each other, right? But think of the vector as something objective. Vector is not something that, you know, that changes simply because you change your basis, okay? You change your basis, that is just a measurement thing, you know? I have x direction this way, you have x direction that way. That does not mean that, you know, some motion is different, okay? So it's like that. Actually, in rigid body dynamics, when you want to write the rate of change of a vector from the body frame versus the lab oh, frame, no. Yes. Very, that's the exact thing that... <laughs> yes. Anybody who does that uh, without looking at notes is <laughs> absolutely <laughs> respectable. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Yes. I mean, I just remember that, you know, in presidency, there used to be in the old presidency library, there used to be a book by Whitaker, <laughs> Analytical Dynamics, about this thing. Uh, I think it was like 500 pages <laughs> with three diagrams. <laughs> okay, and uh, he explained oil at angles in three pages without a diagram. <laughs> <laughs> and I read that. So it took me like a week to understand what he was saying. Really but, analytical. Yes, really? analytical. Analytical is right. I I don't know why they didn't draw the diagrams. Probably because they had to pay a draftsman to draw the diagram. That's why they didn't. Definitely. Anyway, so, right, so we make this transformation. So this is actually the inverse of uh, what we had for the um, components of the vector. So we had u, now we have u dagger. So in the mass basis, the mass basis is given by the new i gets, and the flavor basis is given by the new alpha, right? And the mass basis are diagonal, they, they, they are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is diagonal in that basis. So the stationary states are just to the power minus i t for each mass uh, eigenstate, right? And e i will be p square plus m i, right? p square plus m one square or what. Right, so when I look at the uh, flavor state as time dependent state, I'll find that this uh, mixture, this, uh, I should call it a mixture, this transformed uh, state is what gets into describing the flavor state. And so if I want to look at what the flavors are after a certain time, I evolve this to some time t and look at the uh, projection on each flavor. Okay, that is my uh, transition amplitude. That is what your quantum mechanics says. And so I take the mod square and it gives me the probability. So the probability of finding a neutrino of type beta, if my original neutrino is produced as type alpha, is this. Okay. So ordinarily, if I'm looking at the solar neutrino, it's produced as electron neutrino. And when it comes here, maybe I can find muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos, and maybe not all of them are electron neutrinos. That is the solution, the solar neutrino problem. So if I start with this, um, all neutrinos, I start by saying that all neutrinos are all the different mass types of neutrinos are produced with the same three momentum, which is what you would expect. You have a, a process going on and something comes out, they have a three momentum, which has to be the same because of momentum conservation, but the masses are different. That's why the energies are not necessarily different. Okay. So I'll get this P square by plus M square square root. And then we consider all neutrinos to be ultra relativistic because they're all very fast. The masses are extremely small. So if they're ultra relativistic, I can break them up in this form. So there is some E overall uh, average, you say, which is this. This mod P is the uh, some basic energy. And uh, then the uh, each of the types of neutrinos, each of the mass types, can be 
witness this. And, and this one thing yes. in Brenton, they get uncomfortable with what I found. Oh, okay. Is that if you don't put each cross there, so you say that each was equal to one. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Yes, you are right. You are right. This, this is what I say. When I when I make uh, when I make a talk later on, yes, absolutely. You are absolutely right. Each bar is one. Each cross is equal to one. Each is one. Yes, I think they're not seeing. Yeah, see, it's one, I think that's... See, this is, this is one nanosecond. You know that, right? This is one nanosecond. So, C is one. This is length. I mean, this is one nanosecond. Length is time, time is length. Nanosecond, nanosecond is 30 centimeters. So, one foot. One foot. <laughs> so this is this is what astrophysicists do. Be careful. Be very careful. The age of the universe is giga years. Doesn't matter how many. So everything is in parsecs. Parsecs and light years are the same. So anyway. So um, then in the mass basis, I can write the Schrodinger equation like this. In the mass basis, the Hamiltonian, the free Hamiltonian is diagonal, right? So only the free Hamiltonian, I'm simply writing the free Hamiltonian for the uh, two neutrinos in the mass basis. So I can write it like this, right? Everybody agrees with this? You can go to the next one. Any question? Sorry? <laughs> I have not done any alpha beta at this moment. Huh? It has a mass basis. It has a free Hamiltonian to diagonal. Is it Schrodinger equation to subsum a diagonal for me? Huh? Alpha beta anthel or Hamiltonian to diagonal thugban. Flavor? Flavor? Electron mu1, whatever. I'm doing with electron and mu1. Take a set. What are mass basis now? Alpha beta are mass basis. Flavor basis. Okay. Flavor basis. Flavor basis. Flavor basis. Flavor basis. Flavor basis. Flavor basis. जिज्ञेसम so the flavors will occur when I look at oh my drive go back here. Have I done this? Okay, so this was the free Hamilton. So after the free Hamiltonian, I have to talk about interactions. So neutrino interactions are always going to be weak interactions. And they will be interacting only with other electrons or protons or neutrons in matter. Okay, in other complicated cases, there may be other things. So, neutrinos in matter will have electronic interactions with electrons, protons, and neutrons. And they do that. I have not drawn the diagrams because, again, they ran out of time and didn't have time to draw these pictures. So, they have, they do by exchange of charged or uh, neutral gauge bosons. So, I don't know if you have done field theory, maybe you have not. But if you do, you will know that all interactions proceed by exchange of bosons. Okay? Not exchange of fermions, exchange of bosons. Okay? So, particularly exchange of gauge bosons in most cases. And uh, like electrodynamics is done by exchange of photons. Okay? And strong interactions proceed by exchange of gluons. And weak interactions are done by exchange of um, charged. W plus minus bosons or neutral Z bosons or photons. Okay, so because this is electroweak, this electroweak theory is what uh, Weinberg, Salam, and Glashow got Nobel Prize for, and uh, this was sort of the major unification after Faraday. Faraday unified electricity and magnetism, and this electroweak theory they unified weak interactions. Not exactly unified, but basically they said that all these particles have the uh, I could write the interactions of all these particles uh, in uh, sort of the same, um, using the same gauge bosons. So these gauge, there are two kinds of gauge bosons, neutral gauge bosons, so the Z and gamma, and uh, this W plus minus charged gauge bosons. You have one is the uh, antiparticle of the other. Anyway, so 
I'm not going to go into that very much, except saying that the uh, at uh, low energies, I can write this as an effective four fermion interactions. So it's like uh, you have, if you ignore photons, you have this Coulomb interaction and you have um, static interactions, right, in general. So in the case of uh, weak interactions, if you ignore the um, exchange of the bosons, if you ignore the bosons, you think of them as coming to Together and going off. Okay, uh, that is when the interact the interaction always takes interactions must be local in space and time. Okay, because of relativity, you cannot change the position and time of interaction simply by going to a different frame. So if you have something exchanged, then you can do that as a relativistic theory that in one frame, uh, you know, there is a, some exchange going on. In another frame, also there is some exchange with slightly different properties. But if you try to ignore that, in, which you can at low energies, sufficiently low energies, the exchange energy is so small that you can ignore what is being exchanged. And then you have to think of them as point-to-point -point interactions. So then it's like one current coming in, another current coming in, they interact and they go off. Okay, current is a four-dimensional current. Okay, so both charge and current density. So for the case of, sorry, you have a question? Yeah, I agree. Yes. So uh, in the fourth point, we have written the particle antiparticle in the second bracket. If and uh, if, uh, what is the significance of writing them as if? That is funny. Some sign was like function. I have just written this. Yes, yes. I mean that that was quite okay, but why write it? New e, new e. Expression. New e, new e. Yes, yes. What's that? You have just written the basis. Yes. Okay, yeah. Right. And the student of the Psalm. And the Gamma Mu and the Gamma Matrices. Gamma Mu and the Dirac Gamma Matrices. Dirac Gamma Matrices. Yes. Because this is the current. This is the current of neutrinos. This is the current of the photons. Okay. And this is something that is important, but not for, not, you know, this this part does not get into the explanation for this. Is that this weak interaction, this is an important contribution of Salam. Uh, that this weak interaction is uh, between left chiral particles. So if you think of massive particles, uh, they all have spin, right? So this all fermions have spin. All fermions have spin half or something else, but all the known fermions, all the known elementary fermions have spin half. So if they are massive, you look at them moving, okay? And uh, then if you look at their spin, either it is right-handed uh, rule, or it's the opposite of that. If it follows the right-handed rule, then it's called right chiral. Okay, not right helical actually, not right chiral. Yeah. Somebody is going to kill me. Yeah. Somebody is going to kill me if I said that. <laughs> but yes, no. That, there is a reason why I said that. Chiral means handle. Yes. Okay. Chiral means handle. This is a Greek word. Chiral means handed. But this handedness is related to the helical property. If it is massless, then the helicity is the same as chirality. But if it is massive, you can still define a chirality, but if it's massless, you cannot define helicity. But what you can say is that for if, if you say if you look at massless particles, if the spin is along, massless particles are always moving at the velocity of light. Right. right? So if they're also spinning, if they're fermions, if the spin is along the direction of motion, it's right chiral. If the direction is opposite to the direction of motion, they're left chiral for massless particles. For, mass, for massive particles, you can break them up into right and left chiral components, but they're not independently. I mean, the helicity is not the same as chirality because you can bring them to a stop. And even then, something called chirality can be defined, but helicity cannot be if they're not moving. Anyway, so it's, I don't know. It's, 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 Chirality is handled. Anyway, oh, so you, you have about ten minutes. Oops. Okay. So I'll I'll finish quickly. So uh, at ordinary density, so this is uh, what I should have come upon here. So at ordinary densities, I'm writing this uh, as I said that I'm not writing this in terms of the Lagrangians or Hamiltonians, in terms of, but in terms of equations. So this is the interaction term in some basis. And if I look at the ordinary densities, I can replace the second. Uh, term, this bracket in the second term, I can replace that by the average in the Hamilton. Okay, there is no self interaction. The neutrinos are not interacting with themselves. So, whatever happens to the background fermions does not directly affect the neutrinos. So, I can replace the background fermions by their average current. 
by the current, by the classical kind of average, okay? almost classical average. And then I can say two things that this W plus minus exchange has to take place only with charge left arms because there's a charge, right? So at each point where there is exchange, charge must be conserved. So if there is only if there is a charge left on the other side, I can have an exchange of a charged particle. Otherwise, the charge goes from the neutrinos and where does it go? Or it comes to the neutrinos, where does it come from? So on the other side has to be a charge left on. Uh, and uh, so therefore, remember that the electron neutrino has must have an electron with it. Because it's a doublet. Wherever the electron neutron is, there has to be an electron as well. So it will have a charged interaction with the uh, electron. But other neutrinos, other flavors of neutrinos, they will not have charged interaction with electrons. Okay. Matter has only electrons. Matter does not have muons and tau, tau particles. It has only electrons. So with electrons, only electron neutrinos will interact, not the tau and mu particles. So if whatever comes from the sun has become muons and tau, they are not going to interact with the electrons that are in matter, uh, not by charged interactions. But they can interact by the neutral current, neutral boson interaction. Okay, So they can interact by exchanging Z or uh, gamma. And all electrons can uh, ex exchange Z or gamma with electrons, protons, and uh, uh, neutrons. All neutrons can do that. But then the contributions of electrons and protons cancel. I've not shown that, but it's a, it's a little more complicated than we are showing here. But they will cancel, and only the neut neutron contribution will remain. So these two have slightly different values. Okay, electron and proton cancel because electron and protons are they are the same number of electrons and protons in ordinary matter because ordinary matter is uncharged. So that's why the you know the contributions are opposite, so they'll cancel. And then. In the Schrodinger equation, I mean, right? so this is the advantage of using two by two matrices. And uh, because three by three will have three by three here and three by three here, and I'm going to tell you what it is. So in the mass basis, you can look at the second line, that is what the Hamiltonian looks like. Okay, so this is my flavor. This, this is what takes it to the flavor. I have the diagonal interaction in the flavor, and then I come back to the mass basis. And the remaining is the remaining part is diagonal in the matrices. Okay. Because I'm looking at the Schrodinger equation, I have to look at the Hamiltonian where it is diagonal, otherwise I cannot solve this directly. Right? So this is the trick of doing that. And then I go to the flavor basis. Okay. So earlier I had time, you can always uh, ask this question. I have DDD here and I have DDX, and that is because the neutrinos are traveling close to the speed of light. So time is basically distance. Okay, so I can change time to the distance traveled by the neutron. Time traveled and distance traveled are essentially the same. So that is why I have this ddt by ddx. And here, what I have done is I have multiplied by u dagger on the left, and this becomes the flavor basis, and u dagger is here. So <coughs> I have gone from diagonal in the mass basis to diagonal in the flavor basis. So then I have just broken this up. So if you look at this carefully, you will see that this is exactly right. Okay. And this is very simple algebra, yeah. nothing else. And for two flavors, as I mentioned, that this is just a rotation matrix. And this calculation is slightly more complicated. So just from here, you can solve this. You can solve this, calculate. You know, mu e going to nu mu means that I have to find the time dependence or x dependence of nu e states and take the projection on nu mu. That is what I wrote earlier, right? Nu mu on the left and nu e of t on the right. That will give me the uh, probability, that will give me the uh, transition amplitude and this mod square of that is the probability and this L comes from the distance. So that is like time. L by c is the time. Okay. <laughs> GF has set a constant, GF has set a constant. Fermi constant. With interaction constant. With interaction constant. The Fermi constant. When I gravity is in the GF, G, second, we can actually have it. Right. Electromagnetic protocol constant is alpha. Alpha. One by one. With interaction of the GF. Can the alpha touch dimension less? 
ियलिटीट्रॉन बीम will change it will go from something very small uh, actually something uh, it will go from zero to something you know much larger usually okay not necessarily one because uh, this number is still here but uh, it will change okay so not all the electrons that started out are going to be there after a distance L. okay so that is the solution of the solar neutrino problem And delta m that is the uh, that is just a redefinition of delta m square delta m square is mass difference yeah delta m square is the mass delta mass difference square is the mass difference square in matter yes this has to be again it is transformed to mass basis in the matter yes here is the matter okay. this is the matter this matter effect came from the uh, this okay. this matter effect came from the neutral charged interaction this came from the charged boson Exchange. Okay, so all together, this neutral uh, boson exchange is for all the neutrinos with all the matter. So that is because it's for all the neutrinos in the amount. So delta m square is just the mass difference. Just the mass so square difference. Mass square difference, difference. Yeah. in vacuum. Now this, this is in what you see in matter. This is what you see. Okay, so you can see that there is an oscillation because of. It is become equal when your a is equal to zero. When a is zero. दुटो न्यूट्रिन मास एम स्कोर वन टू लिखे एम स्कोर वन एम स्कोर टू एम वन एम टू सो डेल्टा एम स्कोर इज एम स्कोर टू माइनस एम स्कोर वन कैपिटल ना ना तुम्हारे तो उटा तो फ्लेवर बेसिस है होगा तो किंतु तुम्हारे तो प्रोपोजिशन पूरा तो उटा मास बेसिस है तो अपने मैटर के मुद्दे फ्लेवर बेसिस पर तीन होगे करो इंटरेक्शन रोज चीज फ्लेवर जानते ही होगे ना जो कुछ बढ़ गया ये बार इटा के आवाज इंटरेक्ट मास कौन करे मास मैटर के मुद्दे मास बेसिस मासन फोर्स मैटर उटिंग 
So this is basically looking at the dynamics of fermions in curved space time. And that is not straightforward. So what you have to do is basically your other than ordinary gravitation between matter. So uh, because fermions have a certain kind of, you know, they satisfy Dirac equation in flat space. Uh, here in curved space time, they generate something called torsion. Okay, so to space time torsion. So that is like a, that is a non dynamical field, means it does not propagate. Okay, so ordinary gauge bosons like photons and uh, uh, your charge gauge bosons, Z, etc., they have an equation of motion. Okay, you solve the equation of motion in boundary conditions, you find something. Okay, different boundary conditions will give you different things, different sources will give you different things. The torsion is completely defined by the sources, there is no dynamics. Okay, it's a non dynamical field. The equation of motion is algebraic. So, when you write the equation of motion, you get a solution directly. So, the field is equal to some other combination of some other fields. Okay, that is what is called a non dynamical. Right. So that means you can eliminate that from the action. Huh? Eliminate that from the action. Jehetu, because it is the solution, it is always, you know, the equation of motion itself is the solution. That means you can put it back in the other equations of motion. Right? Because it's just a combination of the other fields. There is no derivative in the equation of motion. So you put it back in the other equations. And once you put it back in the other equations, that gives a new equation for the other things. Okay. So if you do that at the level of the Hamiltonian or at the level of the action, that gives a new interaction between the fermions. The torsion is eliminated and you get a new four fermion interaction. So I had an earlier four fermion interaction, if you remember, from the effective interaction that came from uh, ignoring the uh, exchange bosons and weak interactions. Here I get here you don't have to ignore anything. This is scale free. This is at all scales. Okay, this is not at low energies. At all scales, I can integrate out the integrate out or eliminate this torsion field. And then I'm left with a detective four fermion interaction, which is this. You can see that it's a, a quadratic square. So it's a four fermion. And this sum is over all fermions. Not only neutrinos, not only electrons, not only any specific thing. Every fermion in the universe will cause this torsion when it's put in curved space time. Every fermion will couple to this torsion. And when I eliminate every fermion will couple to every other fermion and itself. Okay. So self interaction is also there. And these lambdas I have written, these are all unknown. Okay. These must be determined from experiments. Okay. So there is no principle or uh, you know fundamental principle or theory <laughs> that will produce these lambdas. These are like the GF, but GF, the Fermi constant, after weak interactions were you know found to be a gauge theory, there was a way of calculating the Fermi constant in terms of other things that we know or other things that you could find out. But here there is still no way of figuring out what these constants are because there is no universal. Uh, property that connects all the fermions in curved space time. So in mass basis. Yeah. In mass basis. Because they are part of the Dirac equation, they appear with the Dirac equation, they are going to be diagonal in the mass basis and not in the flavor basis. So this is exactly opposite to the weak interactions. Okay. And then for neutrinos in matter, this interaction is diagonal in the mass basis, but they have to be in matter because it's a four fermion interaction. If there is no back, background fermion, there's not going to be an interaction. Outside of the uh, fermions, there is no torsion. Okay. So they have to be in matter. And now you'll have a new interaction, which is diagonal in the mass basis. And as soon as you go to flavor, that gets, that gets mixed as well. Okay. Like the mass difference, the mass squared difference, now you will have, okay, I have not written that, so this Hamiltonian is now a new um, contribution of the Hamiltonian. Uh, there is, there are these lambdas which corresponding correspond to the three types of neutrinos, three uh, mass types of neutrinos, and n tilde is a kind of weighted density of the background fermion. Okay, so all neutrinos will have this contribution in the Hamiltonian. The um, 
evolution, Schrodinger equation. डायगनल contribution okay and that will affect all these things and not only all these things it will affect all fermion interactions not only neutrinos it will also affect you know uh, this is a, this is actually a parity violating interaction so it will affect uh, parity experiments it will affect cp violation experiments and many other things Basically, a neutral neutral current type interaction. There is no charge coming. Charge. So that's it. And these are based on, you know, these papers. Estimate which? Which one? 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 ग्राविटिंग गैस there are right handed quarks there are no right handed neutrinos as far as you know there may be but we don't know that so there are some sort questions like why those mixing levels are so low and they are they are so big well if you have this additional thing that might help in the explaining yes because that will change everything so what surprisingly again theta theta 1 2 plus theta 1 3 But Mass remember, theta. those are model. They are they are model dependent, right? They did not assume this yeah. values of theta one two and theta one three. Uh -huh. They are they are calculated assuming, or uh, without assuming this additional interaction. Right, right. Okay. Right. So right. once you take these and right. let all of them run free, uh -huh. maybe right. things right. will change. You don't know. No, but they are. I mean, theta one two. I mean, theoretically, nobody is stopping you to have uh, from having a last. Uh -huh. But earlier also, theta one two plus theta one three. Plus theta two three is approximately equal to pi by two. Pi by two. That means the approximation may be actually. We don't know. There are other questions. I have two questions. I have the first one. You can ask both. I have no problem. The time wise, others will be there. So the 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 curved space time. Yes. Uh, if you go to the slide, uh, am I correct in understanding that? Uh, the in the extra kind of uh, so for example here is the effective four fermion interaction that is different from flat space time so is it some is it that has to do with the property of space time the yes. curvature of space Absolutely. time right? yes but then comes the point that uh, if somebody has to see this effect like for example here when we are talking about curvature of space time is this like local curvature Or is it a global curvature? No, no, it's a local equation. This Dirac equation. So, so for example, if there is a massive object, 
And if I have curvature of space time, we should be able to have something. It is like not curvature directly. There is no curvature term in this. Okay. So then, uh, how is the space time property being incorporated here? If you have flat space time, this will not appear. This will not appear. So uh, not, not flat, flat space time in that sense. Not flat. I mean, we cannot have flat space time. We live in a universe that has gravity. Yes. So we cannot have flat space time. Right. That is why we have. But if you were to live in a universe, imagine a universe where which is flat, which has no gravity, then this term will not be there. Okay, so, so, so we lambda value depends on the curvature. No. Then uh, how can lambda I go from, How can I go from here to the local inertial? Okay. They will always be there. Local inertia can still have this. That is the point. You can go to the approximately flat laboratory uh, space, space time, which is locally inertial, and you will still have this fourth form interaction. There is no torsion here. There is no gravity. But if you did not have gravity, you will not have this. Oh, so, so, so the idea is that it is because the gravity is there. So we will always have this. We will always have this because, because of time, because. Gravity is present in okay, but then the, the other term that we generally use as a good party interaction that is for uh, weak interactions, right? yeah, that is for weak interactions that is defined in flat space time. Oh, yeah, that is defined in flat space time. So, this mm -hmm. has nothing to do with that thing, no. that is just the weak interaction that you is. define in flat space time, and this is an effective interaction that is coming from curvature, from gravity, but not curvature. Not, not gravity has two parts. Gravity yeah. has two parts. Gravity has one. I mean, if you think of the local Poincare symmetry, mm -hmm. one part is Lorentz, one part is translation. Yes. Okay. So, because of these two parts, you get both your ordinary general relativity and you have this addition. Okay. So, then is there a way that we can, uh, you know, we take uh, these kind of experiments? Yes. 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 Uh, in neutrino experiments, in parity violating experiments, and CP violating. So that's the experiment. You know something you are talking yes. about. Yes, you need neutrino. Yes. For where you can get those lambda values, the yes. interaction yes. of the constants. Yes. But has, Dune is a, still not functional. But there are other experiments. You can look into. Yes. 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 I just want to ask you, sir, that is, uh, you want to an entire talk, you have considered that it is a real particle. Yes. So, instead, if I consider it is a neuron particle, so how would the oscillation length and oscillation time scale be real? Yeah. Um, probably not at all. No, no, not at all. For yeah. oscillation, nothing will change. Only another change will come, but that can be rotated away. Yeah. I mean, it's not yeah. a Mahayana yeah. particle. It's a wild particle with a Mahayana mask. No, no, no. Oscillation will come, but it will change. Yes, that's all. Yes. So, yes. Uh, I could see So, then, can you tell us that the first thing, as well as the favorite thing? They are commute. No, not commute. They are not uh, parallel. They are not parallel. They are not parallel. Yes. Second, the first slide, I have a question. What are you asking? 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 Ita. Our model, 
इलेक्ट्रन सक इलेक्ट्रन तो 